if somebody orders you, you 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 do fair and just compensation. And like the the man over in England, he's been doing great over there with the 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 government over there because people are calling him up like crazy, and he's going into courts and he's going into uh, government meetings with these people, and they said, are you ordering this man to do X, Y, and Z? And they were like, yes, you know, well, you know, it's like, well, on this piece of paper, it says he must do this, he must do this, he must do that. And they're like, so, so why don't you just change that word from must to order? And they said, well, you know, it means the same thing. It's like, no, it doesn't mean the same thing. You mean like when you go to McDonald's, the lady at the counter says, oh, sir, can I take you a must? <laughs> no, the lady would say, can I take your order? So a must doesn't make any sense in that sentence. So just put the word ordering down there, and this man will be glad to carry out your public servant's orders, and I'll make sure that he carries out your orders. See, he's not okay. saying why, because the public servants know. They can't order you. Some cops will just start freaking out. It's like, no, I'm not ordering you. Then what, what do we have to talk about today, sir? Well, I, I want your driver's license. It's like, okay, just order me. Well, I'm not going to order you. Well, then what do you want to do, sir? Well, I, I want it. Okay, just order me. Just say, I order you to give me your driver's license. Just order me, and I'll carry out your orders. What's the problem? Most cops just say, yes, it is an order, because they don't know. But I talked to a young state trooper the other day, and I said to him, I was driving my sister's van, and he stopped me, and he said, uh, her tags are expired. I said, oh, yeah, December's a birthday. They expire on her birthday. It's January. Oh, that's right. I said, I shall get them registered. And he says, oh, okay, I shall be right back. So he went to his car and he came back with a ticket. I said, oh, that's lovely. I said, but you were clear. You clearly heard me say, I shall register it. He says, yes, I heard you say that. I said, you do know what the word shall means, right? And he says, yes, they trained us at the academy. That shall mean something in the future that you haven't really done anything wrong today, but they still told us to just write out tickets anyway. I said, do you realize what you just said to me? I said, do you realize that what you just said is uh, is systemic? It's within an organization to be doing something illegal and unlawful. You're telling me you were trained that you know what the word shall means, that I'm not doing anything wrong because the future hasn't occurred yet, but you still are trying to find me and penalize me for something that I have yet to do? I said, have a lovely day, sir. And I said, I'll be so glad to see you in court on April 2nd. And you explain yourself to the court what you just did. I said, stay safe out there, kid, you know, and uh, drive safe and, uh, you know, God bless you. And I left. I just laughed because he told me that the academy teaches the state patrol officers what the word shall means, that they don't have any jurisdiction or control or capacity to order a man to do anything. And they know shall mean something in the future that at some time in the future, maybe the government will have control over man. Maybe we could order man to get a car registered. But we can't order a man to get a driver's license. We can't order a man to get a registration. We can't order a man to get an inspection sticker. But man is tricked. We'll trick them by using the word shall. And they'll think shall means must. But we as government know we can't order a man to do a freaking thing. So see, they're teaching... These troopers, they can't order a man to do anything. So that's the whole thing that you've got to try to get into your head. Okay. And so then I took the ticket back and I returned it. And the court clerk they, um, told me she was going to throw it um, in the trash. Um, um, then I filed that um, um, notice to cease and desist against the officer, against the court clerk, the city attorney, because at first they told me the city attorney would be prosecuting it. Um, What's and, the ticket for? And, um, failure to stop. Okay. And so um, then still found out it was on the docket, so showed up in um, court and um, the judge let me read a statement where I, um, I basically listened to your stuff and had written all of the things down to say. What did you and, say to him? What did you say? I said, I said um, well, ma'am, I was traveling the other day, and this officer stopped me, and as far as I know, for no reason. I harmed no one and damaged no property. If I did, I'd like to find out who and settle with them. Now this officer is bringing this complaint against I, and I don't answer complaints. I return the complaint with a letter in good faith to Pam, the court clerk at the window, and told her I was not willing to contract with them. 
I followed up with a cease and desist notice along with my fee schedule, which I sent first by mail to the officer, the clerk, and the city prosecutor, who I, who I was told would be prosecuting the case since I know that you can't prosecute it. And today I find that this matter has not been taken care of, and I know you don't want to violate your oath of office. I know you can dismiss or just charge <clears throat> this matter, and I'm waiting for your answer. I am a woman, so act accordingly. Ma'am, you just used my stuff, Billy Thornton stuff, Dean Clifford stuff, Winston Shroud stuff, uh, Freeman of Montana stuff. You used everybody's theories in one letter. <laughs> I just say, who's the man who's going to come forth and make the claim? I'm here to compensate any, any of any man I've done wrong. That's all I say. But you used I Billy Th- I mean, you used, so, you used everybody. I mean, you just threw the whole kitchen sink with all the pots and pans and spoons and everything at this poor lady judge and she's like what is this what you know this is like every free man speech dialogue rhetoric i've ever heard in my life it was it was good it was funny but no my thing is one sentence two cents i'm here to settle that who makes who's making a claim i owe a debt who, who's claiming i did wrong well, she, um, um, because this was arraignment court, and she was just pushing it on, and you were either supposed to be guilty right. or um, not guilty, or you right. were going on the trial. And so, right. so she did, kept, did you um, listen? Did you, did you listen to my very first on my on on this talk show thing I got? I think it's a one two seven four six nine. I said, uh, call uh, destroys Gordon. Because Gordon was trying to get jurisdiction on me. Gordon was trying to arraign me. And all I said to Gordon is, may I have leave of court for pen and paper? If, he says, what happened if they just drag you in irons and chains? I said, can I have a piece of paper and pen? And so you had a paper and pen. All you had to do is present to the court. It's like, I have this notice to present to the court and hand a copy of the notice to the court. I am here to claim, I am here to settle a debt. Who is the man who's going to come forth to claim that I've done wrong and not settle the debt? That's all I'm here to do today. I'm here to settle any debt that any man claims is due and true. That's it. You make something really simple like that, and you pass the notice to everybody in the court. And the judge says, all I want to hear is guilty, not guilty, no contest. It's like, okay, did you not get my notice? Yes. Okay, that's all I have. I've answered the court. I've put a proper answer before this court. Do as you wish. And that's it. That's how you handle an arraignment. Okay. Let them bear the the liability of guilty, not guilty, and no contest. Well, she she looked at me and she, and she asked me again what I was gonna you know what I was gonna plead and I told her that I you know had given my statement and I given her a chance and I had a claim ready to file and I believed that I had the right to free travel and the Supreme Court believed I had the right to Supreme. See, this is um, your problem. This is what I'm telling everybody's problem is that they got a they got a tongue attached to their throat. You're supposed to do everything in writing. If that let, ma'am, this is what this I, is every not just you, ma'am, everybody who's listening to this thing, when you get asked a question in court, you ask for leave of court. And the judge will say, why? Uh, I need, I, I want to answer the court properly. I'm going to require of this court to give me leave of court so I could give a proper answer. And he'll say, how long will that take? Uh, about two, three minutes. And then you write it down. And then you hand it to them. You don't get into a, a conversation with these people verbally. You will lose. There is no way in the world you're going to hold your own in court. You do it all in writing. And you hold them all liable because if the judge wants to enter guilty, not guilty, no contest on you, what do you say? Can I have leave of court, Your Honor? What? I would like to answer the court whether, you know, you, 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 you wish to enter the leave on my behalf. Good. Can I have leave of court for a second so I can properly answer the court? Yes. Yeah. Let me write this down real quick. And you say, okay. you, will, you know, you, you will bear all liability. Whoever enters a plea on my behalf will bear liability. And that's it. The judge knows what you're doing by just saying, if you enter anything on my behalf, if you order anything on my behalf, like you order 10,000 pancakes, you're going to be liable for that order. If you're going to order me to reappear, if you're going to order me to appear in 20 days to answer this, you're going to be a liability. I already did, I did that once for my sister back in 2007, 2008. The judge was like shit in a pickle. He was looking around the courtrooms like, who wrote this? Who wrote this? Because in a civil matter, they can't compel you to fight. They can't, they can't compel you to put up your dukes and fight, or they can't say... When you go to court, it's supposed to be like a, it's a battle. It's instead of uh, people shooting each other at dawn, pistols at dawn, they wanted to handle it civilized. You know, with that Alexander Hamilton, Burr, you know, they, they killed each other. They said, that's enough. We're going to have to settle our uh, squabbles amongst man 
in a civilized manner in a courtroom. So we're going to promote this uh, civil courts. So like I said, it's a very simple rule in uh, Virginia, Virginia that I know of that I used. It's a Virginia, it's a Virginia Supreme Court ruling. Uh, 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 what is it? Two? I'll try, I'll try to get it. I'll try to get it down uh, in in a couple of minutes. But it's a very simple. It's a two. I can't remember if it's two FB. But it says something very simple that if the judge, if anybody orders uh, the case to move forward, and both parties aren't ready to move forward, the person who orders the case to move forward is going to be liable. So I'm trying to remember uh, two. I'll find it in a couple of minutes. I'll, I'll Google it real quick on my computer. Uh, what it is? The Virginia okay, Supreme Court. So- but that, nobody can compel so, you to fight. Nobody can p- compel you to, to do anything. They can't order you to answer. They can't order you to open up your mouth. They can't order. And if somebody wants to put in, uh, if somebody wants to uh, enter in something on your behalf, you just tell them that you know you put in a writing that they're going to bear liability. So I'm supposed to show up March 4th, and there's a judge, and the police officer is the one who's prosecuting this claim against me. So I do not speak. I just hand them written. Everything you've got to do, everything in writing. You have to stop talking, because every time you start talking, <laughs> they get jurisdiction. What if they're talking Chinese to you? They're talking legalese to you. They're talking Cantonese. They're talking Vietnamese. They're talking okay, legalese. So, well, what happened to how you said where you go into the court and you ask if anyone has a claim against? You put it in paper. That? I put it on paper. I put it on paper. I put it on paper. Go listen to my very first talk show with Gordon okay. Hall. Gordon Hall was going bananas because I said, Gordon, I don't have a tongue attached to my throat. I would never be stupid enough to open my mouth and utter anything in open court. Gordon, I've been doing this a long time, and even I'm not stupid enough to open up my mouth. And all you people who have no experience whatsoever are opening up your mouths. And I'm not crazy enough to open up my mouth. What makes you people possess you people to think that you should open up your mouth and speak legalese, Cantonese, Vietnamese? They speak in a completely different language. So when is the time for you to open your mouth? Because I've heard you say you need to speak it. Only when a man is speaking to you. You have to know if you're speaking man to man. Oh, yeah, and and the Supreme Court, the Virginia Supreme Court rule is it's VSR 7, like 8, it was 5, 6, 7. 7B, like Bravo 2, 7B2. And that, that's, the, that's the one that you could basically base it off of, the 7B2. The 7B2 basically just says that you can't be compelled to uh, uh, fight or, or defend yourself or do anything until you're ready, until you're damn good and ready. If it's a civil matter, you move when you're ready to move. That's why people always say civil trials are horrible or when civil lawsuits are horrible because it could go on forever. Like, especially with attorneys, they could just bounce it back and forth, back and forth, back and forth forever. It's civil. You can't force somebody to fight until they're ready to fight. You can't force somebody to stand their ground and say, okay, in civilized, you, you still have a chance to prepare and get ready, prepare and get ready. It, it lasts forever. That's the rule in, in Virginia. It's Virginia Supreme Court Rule 7B2. Although it's FB2. It's 7B2. But I haven't, I haven't done that, looked for that silly rule in years. But uh, like I said, that's just something that you guys could refer back to and say, oh, I see what you're saying. So there's probably something in Texas or California and Oregon, basically the same thing in civil proceedings, that you can't force me to move forward with my, uh, you know, my defense, my claim, my case, unless until I'm ready. They can't force you to fight in a civil matter. It's not civilized. So like I said, I, I, don't, I say as little as possible when I go into court. You know, I just say, did you not understand the notice? Did you not read the notice? What part of the notice did you not understand? I'm just here to settle a debt. That's the only way you could force me into court that I've done wrong. Who is coming forth to make the claim that I have done wrong? It's that simple. Who's here to say I broke the law? Okay. The cop says, okay. If the cop says, if the cop says, well, you know, this is the law. No, that's a code. It's a code. It's not the law. There is a public law. It's enrolled somewhere on parchment, somewhere in the state capitol, in some sort of congressional library or legislative library. The public law is an enrolled document somewhere at the state capitol. What you're quoting is a codification of the law. You're getting a little snippet. You're taking out of context what the law truly reads. Now, are you going to bring the law into the court and unroll the public law and read the public law into the record, 
or is this going to be a lawless court and you're just going to say that this is a code? But if you try to open your mouth and you try to utter what I just said, you're going to look like a moron. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? So you try to put oh, it as simple as you can on paper. I know. So you just said you just take paper in there, and then I just answer them with paper and hand it over? Yeah, that's the best way to do it. Okay. You say, I require leave of court. And me and Bali did it. It was funny. When Bali did it, uh, I thought everybody would laugh when he says, I need leave of court. And the judge says, why? He says, I need to I need to wee-wee. In the United States, we think that's wee-wee. What, what are you, three years old? But no, right. Marina Court laughed. Everybody's like, oh, I guess that's the way they say I got to so, go to the bathroom. So we would go okay. to the bathroom, and I'd go to the bathroom with them, and we'd I'd write something down on a piece of paper from. Okay. So what do I do when they still when they dismiss or and they or not dismiss this, but say that they're going to put a bench warrant if I if why I don't, don't you make pay? A claim, why don't you make a claim that somebody's filing a false complaint into the court and saying that okay, I have done well, no wrong, I have done no wrong, I have broken no law, I am just a a woman going from point A to point B, and I have done no wrong. This man is bringing a false claim into the court that I have done wrong. I have done no wrong. I've okay, we did, we, okay, okay, we did do that claim. Oh, you did make a claim. Well, I haven't. I have it. We didn't file it. I didn't know at what point I was supposed to take that into them. Because I'm, more sure it's more than, I'm sure it's more than sure your claim is more than three or four sentences, isn't it? Yes, it's a page yeah. long. We sent you a copy yeah. in your email. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it should be. It should be right. It should be three or four sentences, and you're done. Say, I'm. You know, say this man. This man has claimed that I have done wrong. This okay. man said that I I, I failed to stop. By mail, you know, it's it's just simple. What did he say that? You, what is his claim that you've done? By my non-failure to stop, I still have caused no harm, no wrong, no injury. This man is making right. a false claim that I owe a debt. Yeah. So you just got to pull yourself away from being a driver. You just got to say, I'm a man or I'm a woman going from point A to point B. Okay, let, let's just put it this way. Say you like that movie, that Omega Man, and you like uh, Will Smith made the remake. Uh, and you're the last man on planet Earth, last woman on planet Earth. Are you going to stop for every freaking stop sign? No. No. Why? Because you're not going to gonna harm anybody, hurt anybody. So why bother? It's advisory. It's all advisory. It's the same thing. Like say you saw a bus you know, hitting two or three cars behind you because the, the driver fell asleep. And what, are you going to stay at the stop sign and say, oh, I better not go through a stop sign because I'll get a ticket? No, you're going to blow through that stop sign and get out of the way of the bus. You know, all advisory, all these codes are for the benefit of man. They're here to advise us how we should act, how we shall act, how we should do something in the future. It's advisory because whatever you say, well, I stayed at that stop sign and that bl bus plowed right into me. So And it broke both my legs. So I'm going to sue the state legislators because they intimidated me. They made me so scared to go through that stop sign. The cops made me so scared that I go through a stop sign that the bus broke my, both my legs. And they'll say, well, why don't you just get the hell out of its way? And I said, well, there's a stop sign there. They'll say, you know all of these codes are advisory. They're just there for your benefit. You've got to use you know, your better sense of your own judgment to act or not act in a certain manner. If you believed it was in your best interest and nobody's going to be harmed, then, you know, it's just advisory. They just put it there to, to help people because they take all the stop signs away. Everybody's going to be freaking out every time they come to a crossing. So they're lovely advisements. It's nice that somebody actually spent the money to put stop signs up, but there's still it's all advisory. There's no law that says you have to stop. It's 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 advisory. Right. Yeah, it's so advice. I it's good advice, so. but you chose not to take the advice. So you chose not to take my advice. Okay, was anybody hurt? No. Did you hurt anybody? No. Then what's the point? Exactly. And if you but actually so. read the code, if you read the code, ma'am, I can almost guarantee if you read the code, it says all drivers shall stop. Okay. Right. Sometime in, sometime in the future, you shall stop. So how could they give you a ticket for something that you ain't done yet? Go well, look at the did. code. Look at the code. I guarantee you Oregon code. And that's what somebody called me up the other day from some state. He said, call, oh, Atlanta. I wish the man from Atlanta was calling up the pizza delivery guy. He said to me, oh, my God, call every single, he was a second mark from Atlanta. There's two marks from Atlanta who doing this silly stuff with pot and stopping their cars and not stopping the tickets, whatever. Then one man from Atlanta read it. He said, oh, my God, call every single code for traffic. He said, shall. I said, right, sometime in the future. You shall stop. You didn't say you had to stop today. You didn't say you had to stop right now. It says in the future you shall stop. Yeah. 
when the government sometimes has control over you. But at this time, well, unfortunately for the government, they don't. Unfortunately for men, we have control over our own actions or inactions. And we can't hold the government liable. Because you can say, look, you said right here in your code book that I shall stop. And since I stopped, I broke my legs. No, ma'am. Sometime in the future, you shall stop. That's what shall means. It doesn't mean must. It says shall. Read the damn thing. And they'll say, oh, that's bullshit. We thought it meant shall means today. No, shall is future tense. And that's what I tell people. Go Wikipedia. It takes you two seconds to hit your keyboard. Shall, Wikipedia, future tense. Not present, not past. Something that will turn in the future. The government officials are incredibly intelligent by writing these codes because they know using these silly little words like shall makes you people believe that it means today. Oh, all, all drivers shall stop. It doesn't say must stop. <laughs> it's like will, will and shall, will, something in the future. When somebody dies, they'll read their will and say what I'd like to do when I carry on from this planet Earth. When I'm no longer here, this is what I will you to do. It's future, not present. So like I said to people, that's a simple way to get out of a lot of that nonsense. It's just say, doesn't your statute say I shall stop? Yeah, what does that mean? Sometime in the future? Is the future here? No. I can tell people all the time, mess with your mom like that. So your mom says, go mow the lawn. I said, okay, mom, I'll go mow tomorrow. Sunny day, next day, pops up, boom. Mom says, you're going to mow the lawn. I said, I told you yesterday. Well, I told you, tomorrow I'll mow it. And she'll say, oh, don't play that silly tomorrow never comes. Well, that's what the government does to you guys. They say, shall. Well, shall never comes. It's that simple. They, they, they know what they're doing. They're just messing with you, just like I mess with my mom. So, yeah, tomorrow I'll wash your car. And then next day, the sun comes up, and mom says, you going to wash my car today? Today? No, no, I thought we agreed on tomorrow. All right. That's what, the that's, what the government, that's what the government is doing to you. It's like, oh, I thought I must stop. No, you shall stop. It, I was telling you, it's just, it's just a game. They're playing word games, you people. Okay. Thank you, Paul. All right. He could call me if he yeah. wants to. I like that guy, man. I, talk, I haven't talked to fake names since, like, April or May. He just dropped off planet Earth. Okay, we're going to move on. All right. He's here. All right, Walking Truth. Let me see. There you go. You've been yeah, you've been unmuted. Do you have a question for Carl? Hi, Andrew. Can you hear me all right? Yeah. Yeah, this is uh, JB in Tampa. How you doing, Carl? All right. Thanks for the uh, – I think one of my questions was just answered with the lovely conversation you just had with this lady because I was confused when we should talk as well because it sounds like you're advising uh, a lot of um, feedback in court, but basically – if I go listen to the Gordon Hall one, which I, I haven't I haven't listened to many of them, but I haven't listened to that one. Basically, every time an answer is required, uh, I just take a quick leave of court, write the answer down, hand it in, and if they they don't respond accordingly, then I, I can say something as simple as Have you did you receive my notice? Did you read my notice? Did you understand my notice? But that right. would be it. That's it. That's perfect, man. That's simple. Okay. They uh, love it, man. That the whole world is two dimensional paper world. They love it, man. Just communicate them at the level that they understand. See, the judge or a guy in a black robe is just like a uh, the interpreter between the, the two dimensional and the third dimension. So he's the interpreter between black and white and three dimensional. So keep it on their level. Never ever never ever cross let them drag your third dimension into their second dimension. They're running parallel tracks, man. It's like parallel rails. Don't ever cross over because they'll run you over. That's what I did in England. It was a lot of fun. For five hours, we were running parallel. I mean, the other side was trying to compel me to answer something in legalese. Just make make a call. Just say something in legalese. Just cross, just cross over our side. Just cross into our dom dominion, our world, into our realm. Just say it, call. Just cross over. Just make one precedent, one citation, one ruling, one statute. Please just do it so we will run you over. We will hold you in our jurisdiction, and we will slaughter you. And I just ran parallel in the common law side, and I was telling those, trying to tempt them to come over. And every time they tried to come over, I just smashed them. They were like, try to say, it's like, boom, boom, boom. And a poor judge was laughing his behind off. You know, well, let me ask you a question right there. Just said, I, I thought I'd just well, said let, me, let, me stop, let me stop you right there and ask you a question. When you say you tried to get them to come over, how did you how did you draw them back to the common side? Did you do it via uh, a written? Uh, no, uh, I was just I'd, I'd be, when when I when I made my when when we made our case to the crown when we made our case to the judge. What I was saying, I'd say speaking in common law, 
And it was funny. The barrister would try to say, well, what you did was wrong. What, uh, you know, this man, da, da, da. I said, oh, you mean an officer? Or you mean a man? You know, it was like, well, he's an officer. Well, you know, is this France? It was like, what? Is this a common law land? Yes. Does a man stand in court? Yes. Does an, or what, where does an officer stand in a common law court, in a common land? It was so funny watching the poor guy saying, look, this isn't France. This is a Napoleonic code. This is a man. This is a law of man. This is a land that is, abides by the common law. So is there a man who's going to make a claim today that any one of these three people have done wrong? Well, they did this. Look, sir, I already agree that everything they did was illegal. I already agree that they're guilty of everything that they've been charged with. Fine. Lovely. But is this France? No. And they have done nothing wrong in this common law land. They have not done anything wrong in England, have they? In, in France, yeah. But this is, is this not a common law land? Yes. Do they not have to do wrong? Yes. Did, did they do something unlawful? He says, well, they did. I said, that's illegal, what they did. And they're guilty of that as charged. What do do? Big deal. Okay, so this, is, this, is, this is the part that I think confuses part of your audience and your followers is you did have this tete-a-tete -tete back and forth with them in that, in that vein, but normally, if you were trying to answer something, you would only do it I, by paper. But yes, you didn't. I never, that. I never talked directly to the barrister. We always talked directly to the judge, who was the interpreter between the second dimension and the third dimension, between statute and legalese and law and man. We made our, we made our, we talked directly to the judge. That's what the judge will tell you. Don't look over the other side. Don't talk to the other side. Talk to me. I'm the interpreter. I'm the judge. I'm the referee here. Okay, so me. Let, let, me, let, me, let me ask you this, and you just told the other lady she can talk when she's talking directly to the man, but now I'm supposed to talk to the barrister or the judge. No, when a man takes – only a man takes the stand. A barrister can't take the stand. So when you're addressing the court, you're addressing either the judge, you're addressing the man who's taken the, the witness stand. You're talking to a man. You could talk to a man. If the man is saying – if the man took the – say I owed you a debt or you owed me a debt. And you took the stand against me. I'm going to talk directly to you, sir. Do I know you? Do you know me? How do you claim I owe the debt? I will talk to you. But the other side, like a barrister or a state prosecutor, is like, if he says I owe a debt, it's like, oh, is that true? Good. Take the stand. And I will talk to you once you're on a stand. Well, he said, I can't take the stand. Then there's nothing for me to say. I only talk to a man who could come forth and make a claim I owe the debt. Do you know if I owe the debt? Do I owe it to you? Do you know if it's true? No, I don't know anything. Then what the fuck are you talking? Why are you okay, saying so, anything in this courtroom? So you say you say that much to him to get him to take the stand, but when he doesn't, then basically the conversation is over. Why are we here? The, right. The judge will the judge will say then you know the law. That like my sister did that when I said that to people. My sister got divorced. She wanted twenty thousand dollars for retaining fee. My dad. I told my mom and dad don't give her a dime. My, my sister. She loves me to death. We do anything for each other. I said, you're not getting a freaking dime from us. You can handle this on your own. Your husband's got three lawyers. Yes. His lawyers, I guarantee you, advise him not to say anything. They just sit there because he's guilty of infidelity. Yes. Good. All you need to do is as soon as you hear anybody other than your husband open his mouth and open court because she was the one moving the claim of, uh, for the divorce. If anybody opens up their mouth on the other side, you immediately object and say, does any of this person who's speaking now at this time have any firsthand knowledge of any of the uh, – uh, anything that uh, has transpired between the relationship between me and that man over the last 20 years, yes or no. If they do, let them be sworn in now under author affirmation, take the stand so we could use it, so we could have it uh, placed upon the record. So as soon as the poor attorney lady tried to speak, my sister said, I object. And the judge said to my sister, wait a second, you had your turn. You said what you had to say, now it's their turn. No, it's his turn. I'm making a claim against him. If he wants to answer the claim, let him speak now. We'll forever hold a peace. If he doesn't wish to speak now, oh, well, I order the court to award me what I wish. So then, uh, like I said, the, the attorney for the other side started to say, but, Your Honor, we're here to represent him. And then the judge said, well, you know the rules. Do you have any firsthand knowledge of any of the, the, uh, any of the events that transpired between these two people over the last 20-something plus years? No. She said, then, lawyer lady, you need to sit down. And then she said, but Your Honor, and then she said, now you need to sit down and shut up. You know the rules. And my sister said, the next thing uh, happened was the three attorneys said to her husband, uh, you better take the stand because the judge is about to award her everything. You better say something in your defense because it's over. We can't do anything for you. The ju she just knocked us out. 
now you better come forth and you better say something. So he did take the stand and my sister just knocked him out anyway because he wasn't prepared. He had nothing to defend himself with. So he came in with three, you know, because he was a Gambino. They had big money. They knew all the judges. They had all the attorneys. They had everything. And I said to my sister, you're not going to beat them with an attorney. You're wasting your time. You're going to have to knock the attorneys out of the game. So just take them out. Just say this. and It'll be all over. And she did, and it was all over. She loved it. She had a good time. Okay. I wish I could uh, have been there. Oh yeah, I would have loved it. It was a judge lady too. Well, let me let me lay just a little bit of groundwork here. Um, I've been defending my own foreclosure for six years. Uh, primarily, I had the most success when I studied Bill Thornton and used his writ of error for about two years. And somewhere along the line, they kind of got me off track. I didn't know how to really close the deal, and it, um, and uh, we, we've been off doing legalese, for lack of a better term. But it all started when in 08, I actually won with a simple challenge of jurisdiction. My case was dismissed with prejudice by a judge, but the judge was retiring the next month. And so he retired. My case was dismissed. The stopper was in place, but they kept filing into the case. And this has been going on for an additional five years, and I've, and I've strung it out. Now, just before I found out about you, uh, like a month before, I was at my wit's end. We were ready to go to trial after six years. I finally got it to where we were going to go to trial, and I didn't know what to do, so I filed for bankruptcy. And we've come out the other end while, while I've been listening and studying to you, but I'm in bankruptcy court with an adversarial proceeding, and I'm bringing oh, wow. a claim against them in the, in the, in the, under the auspices of the, of the, of the uh, bankruptcy court, and the, the claim is basically for a, a violation of my due process wow. and, for, and for a breach of, uh, a, breach of uh, a common law trust, which I set up with the, uh, with the plaintiffs. Yeah. Um, well, like I said, I, I love common law trust. I mean, that's how I got the, the folks out of England, out of one of the uh, crimes or offenses they were charged with was uh, putting forged commercial paperwork into the public. And I said, well, they audited it out of their trust. And I had to explain to the judge three times in open court what a common law trust was compared to a public trust. And a poor barrister was going crazy using for hours of you know, uh, citations, codes, statutes of what, a, uh, what you have to do when you create a trust. I said, that's a trust in a public. I concur. You've got to go to the county recorders. You've got to disclose the beneficiaries. You've got a trustee, the grantor, da 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 I said, but I said to the judge, that's lovely. I'm not arguing anything. He's the best barrister I've ever seen in my life. I said, but what I'm telling you is in a, if, a, if you've got a trust in common law, you don't have to disclose any of the contents to anybody. I don't, I, and, and it was funny how I explained it to the judge, and I did it three times. And then when it came up with the ruling, he said, okay, fine, because he said they were guilty, uh, the forgery, uh, forged instruments in the public, da, da, da. So, but he said, fine, this is a common law land. Okay. So uh, he's like, they didn't do anything wrong. And okay, so the charges, you know, you know of, uh, of uh, entering a forged uh, commercial paper into the public through a trust, he said, fine, you know, that's discharged as well. So it's just funny because, like I said, you have gone through bankruptcy, so you're in the United States Federal District Court, you're saying, correct? I'm in the United States uh the bankruptcy section yeah. of the district court, yes, the adversarial proceeding yeah. is filed under the umbrella of the bankruptcy court, not really USDC. Yeah, yeah. What I'm trying to say is, I try to get people away from this, these, uh, any kind of a statutory courts, a code, you know, codified courts. All you, you're moving under some sort of Title 26, 16, you're moving under some sort of crazy code. Correct. And this is this is what happened to the poor Dean Clifford guy when he got arrested. He was an expert with the codes. He and his crew knew every code on planet Earth that pertained to Canada and Canadian Constitution, all this other stuff. The problem is that he said, well, they said on his uh, when he was talking from jail, was they modified all, uh, amended the codes. So when he was ready to place all of his, you know, work before the court, before the crown, all of it was utter garbage because they amended all the codes. So it's a very dangerous game you're playing by relying upon their codes because they could change their codes at will. And there's absolutely nothing you could do to uh, deal with the interpretation or amendment or the modification of their codes. And I try, all I teach people is how to talk like a man when you go to court. 
how to no, stand on a common law how to how, how to stand on a common law side. We won't have a common law for maybe another maybe forty fifty years. Hopefully, it'll be as long as I'm alive. We'll have a common law system in this country. But I, eventually, it's all going to be codified. I know it's going to be all sort of one world order, new world order. Of course, it's going to be because the kids aren't learning what I'm teaching. You know, so they just, you know, you folks just do it. You know, a police officer waves a badge. So all of you guys just say, oh, it's the law. No, it's not. It's not the law. It's an advisory. Do what you wish. You're a man. You only got so many spins around the sun. Don't hurt nobody and rely upon a common law for your defense that, hey, I didn't hurt nobody. That's nice that a whole bunch of women decided to sit around and say everything I do is illegal. You know, thank you that I got to wear a bubble suit from the time I'm born to the time I die. Thank you for being a nanny state. But I think I got this. I don't think I need your help, and it's certainly not – I don't, you know, require anything of you. Okay, let me, you let, me ask you this. This. let me ask you this question, Carl. Let me try to just take this a step further. I realize that this is not in the vein of what you're teaching exactly, yeah. but I'm already in the BK, and I'm trying to use the AP proceeding – to my advantage while I'm there, I do have a foreclosure that's been stayed back in the regular state, you know, county court. So I filed the paperwork with a common law court of equity, tried to set the jurisdiction myself in common law. They're still putting me, uh, of course, in all the paperwork. I didn't do this. They're putting me as pro se on, online, and I've read your, your case file. Oh, yeah. You, you don't have a choice. When you're in the United States District Court, you are pro se. When you're at the United States District Court, you're a man. Yeah, but I filed it into the bankruptcy court of the United States, not the you just said it. You just said you filed it into, not at. Well, I didn't uh, – I, I, I don't want to play semantics with you. On my heading, my paper heading, it says bankruptcy court in, in small letters of the United States. Okay, so that's, I, not I, gonna I, 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 that's not going to help you. That's not going to help you. That's not going to help you. If you want, If you went to go to a federal court and you wanted to claim that you – well, well, a man can't be bankrupt, so uh, that's what that's what people don't understand. As long as a man is alive, even if he's dead, you could harvest his organs. A man is always worth something, so you can't say that a man is void of any value. I mean, that's ridiculous. You're not bankrupt. So, you know, when you say bankruptcy, you, you should know what the word means when you just say um, – I have value and I have worth. Just at this time, the other side doesn't, you know, believe that what I claim has value. It believes as value. It's like I have a pocket full of Canadian, English, and American money in my pocket, uh, United States money in my wallet right now because I've been over there and I got their money. Now I can't obviously pay somebody with Canadian money because it's seventy cents on a dollar, and English money is seventeen cents, but every ten cents it's one to seven to one. So. Some people would say this money has no value, that money has no value, that money has no value. And money is just a medium of exchange in which two parties agree has worth. So this poor man, when he went to bankruptcy court the other day, the lady said, do you have any money? And he says, no. I said, oh, of course you have money. Of course you have a medium of exchange that's worth, that's, that has value. I said, you fix my cars for me, I do your legal work for you. Or you take care of my cattle for me, and, and I'll take care of your dog. You know, what, what what part of money don't you understand? This lady's just asking you, do you have money? And you said no. You say, yes, I, I, I'm worth, I, I, have a, I have a lot of money. It's like, oh, good. It's like, yeah, just at this time, this man doesn't believe that my money that I wish to offer to him has any value. Like some man in Indiana paid me like 800 bushels of corn. Now, obviously, I don't have a truck to hold 800 bushels. So I found a broker. The broker gave me cash. I took the green, the, the broker took the corn and gave it off to a farmer somewhere. Who knows? But that's what I'm saying. You guys got to start understanding what money means and bankrupt means and value. 